Beijing's thick smog, a constant reminder that air pollution is a problem China cannot afford to ignore. But is the government really trying to tackle the issue and strike the right balance between its impressively rapid economic growth and the quality of life in its cities? China's environmental yin and yang. This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Imagine pollution so bad that it closes schools and kindergartens, pulls cars off the roads, and halts production at more than 2,000 factories. Families actually planning their daily routine around the pollution. Lung related diseases on the rise. For the people of China, they don't need to imagine. This is their reality. In the past month, Beijing has issued two red alerts as pollution reached levels never seen before. And this is what we're discussing today. How can China continue to grow and develop economically and curb pollution at the same time? Because right now, it just isn't happening. Our guests in a moment. First, Adrian Brown sets up the story from Beijing. Well, the skies behind me are unusually clear at the moment after what have been four very bad days of heavy pollution here in Beijing. We've had our second red alert in several weeks. Now, the reason for that is simple. This is a country where people still burn coal to heat their homes and of course this is now winter. The coal industry is a vast industry here. It employs hundreds of thousands of workers as does the steel industry which of course is also very dependent on coal. Gradually the government is starting to downsize these two industries but it is in a sense walking a tightrope because it can't squeeze too hard. If it does it risks creating what it wants to avoid most, which is instability in the economy. So this is a gradual process. The government is committed to gradually easing out, phasing out these heavy polluting industries as it transitions its economy away from heavy industries, but it's going to take many, many years. There is no quick fix as far as China is concerned. If it comes to a choice between, you know, polluted skies or mass employment for blue-collar workers, it will choose employment for workers over polluted skies. Also, China's economy is starting to slow. It's below 7% at the moment. Anything below 4 or 5% would be potentially catastrophic. So the government wants to avoid anything that's going to cause the economy to slow down even further. So it is walking a tightrope, but that tightrope is beginning to fray. You know, smog levels in Beijing this year were almost seven times the maximum exposure recommended by the World Health Organization. That makes the smog a matter of really life and death. Have a look at these numbers. Air pollution contributes to 17% of all deaths in China and more than 90% of Chinese cities fail to meet national air quality standards in the first quarter of this year. 1.6 million people were killed this year because of the air pollution, according to Barclay Research Group which is about 4,400 people every day, which means if we break it down even further, almost 100 people in China will have died from smog and air pollution related issues during the course of this show. We've got a lot to talk about, so let's bring in our guests. In Beijing, first of all, is Einar Tangen. Uh, he's a political and economic affairs analyst on China. Uh, and also advises the Chinese government on economic development. In Nottingham, Steve Tang, senior fellow at the China Policy Institute at the University of Nottingham in the UK. And rounding out our panel in Hong Kong is Tamina Savulyeva, a professor at the Hong Kong Institute of Education. Pleasure to have all of you on Inside Story today. Aina Tang and I will start with, start with you. Those numbers which I just read out, they are the end result of the pollution. That is death, that is the finality. And those are unacceptable numbers. They should be unacceptable to any government. Is it unacceptable to the Chinese government? Have they, do, they, do they positively say this, that this, isn't, this is not right? Absolutely, and it's a matter of uh, national concern. You've uh, seen China take the lead at the Paris uh, talks, uh, climate change talks. Uh, you've seen Li declare war on pollution. The difficulty is, just like other nations in Europe and America, these, China polluted its way to success. 
Uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of the memories of the green fog that enveloped London have kind of gone away. I was there <laughs> when I was quite young and saw it. It was very, very terrible. But this is a, a development pattern that's been repeated time after time. In China's case, because of its size, the problem is huge and it's recognized. Okay. I want to go back to the start. I'll stay with you one moment because what we just talked about there is the end result. I want to go back to the start and seeing as you are there in Beijing, I want you to tell me what the pollution is like itself. Give our viewers an idea of how long this has been going on in Beijing, how long people have had to just live with this. Well, it's not an everyday occurrence. If there's a good rain, snow, or wind, the pollution blows over. And you know, from the uh, if you're up on a eighth or ninth floor of any kind of building because it's so flat, you can see the mountains surrounding Beijing very, very clearly. But on days when the pollution, uh, when the air is stagnant, hmm. it is bad. It can get very, very bad. Today and uh, the last few days have been uh, very, very difficult. It's very cloudy. You can barely see it out your windows. And that's why they've uh, instituted this um, red uh, hmm. alert system and to, to make sure the people are aware. They've closed schools. To what extent do you just accept that as a Beijing resident? You know, you live anywhere in the world, you have to accept some things. You live in the UK, you get used to rain. You live in the Middle East here, you get used to heat and dust. You live in Beijing, you get used to smog. Well, you get used to the traffic, you get used to the smog, but I could have said the same thing about LA in the 1970s. I mean, this, this is, as I said, it's an oft repeated pattern. At this point, it is critical for, uh, for China because ab above and beyond the statistics you mentioned, the fact is that China loses 6% of its GDP uh, on a percentage basis due to the, these causes through mortality, through uh, cr uh, reduced crops, uh, through lost productivity. So it's not something that they're uh, trying, trying to prolong, mm. and it's something that they are indeed taking very seriously. Okay, let's bring Steve Tsang into the conversation now in Nottingham. This is as much an economic story as it is an environmental one, isn't it? And indeed it is, and I would say that it is also a political story. Mm -hmm. um, the Communist Party is definitely committed to clean up the air, but the Communist Party is also dedicated to maintain a high rate of growth. And both are really all about the Communist Party keeping itself in power. And since the government is not an elected government, it does not have a democratic mandate. Its mandate is dependent on the party, the government, being able to deliver a better condition of living to the people of China on a continued basis. Mm. So they have to balance maintaining standard of growth and the non-economic calculation of conditions of living. It's not being balanced though, is it? This is, this is the crux of the whole issue, that how do you keep an economy that size with the growth it's seen for so long on that sort of track, even with the slowdown we've got, how do you keep it on that track uh, and worry about the environment at the same time and worry about the levels of pollution? Well, in a sense, they really um, let an opportunity slip. Mm. When the economy was growing at 10% in the decade leading to 2012, that would have been the decade when they could have afforded to invest a lot more on environmental pr uh, protection, which would probably have slowed down the economic growth by anything like 2 to 3 percent, but then China would still be growing at about 8 percent or slightly less, which was roughly what the original government's target was. Now that would have been acceptable, but now that growth is already slowing down to something between 6 to 6.5 percent, it becomes much more difficult for them to uh, deliver on the environmental protection at the expense of further growth. Mm. So they are in a very sticky situation right now. Tamara Savlieva in Hong Kong, let me bring you in there to build on what Steve has been saying. He's saying it's a, a, basically a quagmire there because the growth is already slowing and China can't afford to let that growth slow any further. So it just has to sort of try to balance these things up. But again, as I argued before, it's not balancing it at the moment. Steve said it all. <laughs> The, co the current issue is everybody's talking about is the balance between environmental protection and growing economy. And that's exactly the problem. 
the lack of focus on what needs attention, which is people, people of People's Republic of China. Why we need to grow, we need to care about economic growth and environmental protection. Why wouldn't we focus on people and economic growth? The problem is not about the dilemma, what to pull first, economy or invest in the environmental protection. The carriage is the economy and the horse are the people. If we put carriage in front of the horse, the carriage will not go anywhere. Mm. As either mentioned, it's a reoccurring problem, not because China and Chinese government and the Communist Party is not investing in the solution, technological mm. or legislative. It's about the conceptual problem of focus on the wrong thing. And, and Tamara, do you feel that the Chinese people actually speak up about this? We make a lot about it, the fact that uh, free speech is, well, not so free in China, but on an issue like the pollution where it's irrefutable, it's there, people suffer, people die from it. Do the people have the bravery to speak up and can they speak up about it? I believe that it's a big misconception that um, Chinese people, as other people, um, do not speak up about their problems. They suffer, they speak up. Yes, the age, in the age of the internet, uh, the political activity, such as um, pro mass, massive protests, uh, as we could see in other countries, or which represent freedom of speech, might not be visible to us from China. But in the age of internet, people speak up about their problems, about their pollution, um, just through the media, which um, which is not Google, for example, mm. which is not Facebook, which is not any other Western media. Mm. Of course they do. Okay then, let's double back round to uh, Aina in Beijing because you've heard what our other two guests have said. Uh, you're the person in Beijing, though. I would be interested to get your response to what we've heard about their beliefs about what the government is doing or, in fact, not doing. Well, I'd, I'd like to first address my colleague in England. Uh, the, the, the fact is, because the communist government is a single party, there's nowhere to run. If you're the Tories and the Liberals or whoever is in power, you can always blame the other uh, group and say that, oh, you know, progress was slowed because of something they did. This is not a luxury that the Chinese government has. They, the buck stops at Xi Jinping's door, and that's why things are pushing. In terms of caring about people, I think they do. Uh, you keep saying that there, nothing has been done, but it has been. Last year, 18,000 uh, factories in Hebei, surrounding Beijing, uh, were closed. Now, why is Hebei doing this? Uh, it's actually made a very large impact into their uh, economic development. They had been exceeding the national average for the last 10 years and ex every year except one. Mm. And this year, they, are t they dropped three points. So they've also closed 35 rock quarries. They also have seven of the most of the 10 top most polluted cities. Mm. So this is something that strikes home. And the, and the netizens of China are not far from it silent about this. Mm. The social network is buzzing every day. The newspapers, it's a top uh, story every single day that these uh, smog alerts go on. And it's not something that the Chinese government is ignoring. And I, I find it hard to believe that people think that that is the case who are outside of well, Beijing. Let me, let me just tell you something that a, a guest told me on another show on Al Jazeera, Counting the Cost, which is our, our economics program. We were discussing the COP21 a few weeks ago. And the guest said to me, look, in Asia, not just in China, but in Asia, there were 500 new coal-fired power stations opened uh, this past year. And he believed there were another 1,000 in the planning. Now, those are very round numbers. But it does speak to an issue there that uh, fossil fuels, that coal, uh, oil and all these things are cheaper at the moment and so people are still going to keep using them, right? Well, they're going to keep using them, but they're less and less in China. Uh, at, at the moment now, China has tripled its uh, commitment to nuclear uh, energy. Uh, the number of plants now being uh, created in China around the world exceeds 100. This is a, a new boon in, in this area. Now, there are problems with nuclear also. 
But in, at the end of the day, you cannot say that the Chinese government is not concerned mm -hmm. and they're not doing something. I think that is a complete mischaracterization. Okay, then Steve. You can say they're not doing enough or moving the direction that you want. But end of the day, this is a top priority, and, and I, I don't know how else you can measure it than by the leaders saying repeatedly, this is a top priority. Remember, in Beijing, the leaders, their children, and their grandchildren live here. This is not something that's vague and far away. Mm. This is something that is critical to them and their personal interests, and it's not the only reason they're doing it. They're doing this countrywide. Okay then, Steve and Tamara, let's get some response from you then, because... I know is laying out some pretty good points there. Steve, you first of all. Well, it is clearly a priority issue for the Chinese Communist Party, but it is not by any means the top priority. If it were the top priority issue, the Leninist political system that the Communist Party runs in China would have been able to deliver the result. The result is, results are not being delivered because it is not yet the top priority issue. The top priority issue for the party is to stay in power by whatever means necessary. The environment is a serious matter that they are aware of and they are tackling and now practically every new power plant being built in China will have the kind of uh, equipment built in to reduce pollution. But we also know that most of those factories switch off those anti-pollution equipment most of the time. Again, it means that enforcement is not being as strictly enforced as it needs to be or should be. And as long as the party does not see it as a life and death issue for the party, rather than just for your uh, 4,000 a day of Chinese citizens, it is not going to be the very top matter that they will be dealing with. Um, every single leader in China will have air purifiers inside their compounds to make sure that when they are inside the air they breathe would be somewhat better than they, everybody else will be breathing in the streets of Beijing. And that again is the kind of reality we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's definitely true that the Communist Party has nowhere to run, but the Communist Party tries to manage the problem and they manage the problem in terms of managing people's expectations and managing how people protest mm. rather than simply focus on increasing the efficiency in the use of energy and therefore reduce the actual amount of pollution. Mm. Uh, we are still dealing with huge amount of inefficiency in Chinese industries and in Chinese energy sector which are responsible for a significant percentage of that pollution we are dealing with today. Okay, Steve, let me interrupt. I'm sure Ina's got a response to that, but I just want to talk to Tamara just uh, quickly before we hear from you again, Ina. Um, you made the point, and Steve has made the point here about the priorities being out of balance, that the priority should in fact be the people rather than the party. But here's the thing. The more China grows its economy or keeps its economy where it is, that means employment and money for its people. Now, in this day and age, when you have a job, that's a really good thing these days. You know, there are a lot of people out there who have suffered in the last few years from not having a job. So the economy grows, people get jobs. Isn't that going to be important as well for the people? Yes, you're pulling the same leg of the same elephant. You're contributing the same discussion. What is more important, economy, environment or people? What shall we sacrifice? And that's not the Oh, that's not the question. What shall be sacrificed um, in the short or long run to save China, to save Communist Party, to save people of China, to save the world, to save the globe? Um, I believe that the question that should be discussed, should be discussed, is how, instead of blaming the politics, political regime, the inefficiency of the policies for the last 30 or 40 years to control air, waste, pollution. What can be done with the current situation and mm. current regime to invest into building people's participation, awareness, education about the environment, 
about the issues. So they can manage themselves. They're already getting voice. As Steve managed, uh, said, the netizens are all, all over about the issue and not for the last five minutes or a year. Mm. What can be done? And I believe that the political system in this case can be used as a benefit. It's a centralized country. How many centralized governments in the world can change their policies overnight? If the Communist Party says that among the priorities and environmental protection became among top five priorities, managing the society, managing the micromanaging the economy, creating jobs and protecting the environment mm. is in the list of Communist Party's plenum priorities. It has been discussed. If the communist country, country, communist party decides that tomorrow environmental education becomes a part of every kindergarten, school, or any educational institution, it sh it will be done overnight. That's the level of implementation of the centralized government. So I believe that. Um, instead of talking about inefficiency and loops of the system, which we're talking for many years, we can discuss the, the benefits of the situation that mm. really can be done to address it. Okay, let's get a quick response from Ina. Just the clock is starting to run down, Ina. So just a quick response and then I've got a few more questions for you. Go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> ideologically, you can bang on China all you want for being a, a centralized economy, but you know the same problems exist in India, which is a democratic country. The question is, how is it being dealt with? I don't know that education is the real issue. I think people in China are very aware that they have an environmental problem. So in terms of what China's doing, they're spending $40 billion in uh, money directly related to these uh, issues about uh, all the things you said about coal. Now remember, two-thirds of China's economy is now in the private sector. Only one-third is in the public sector. So the government actually has less direct control than it used to. And this idea that they're turning off these, uh, <laughs> these pollution controls may be true in the past, but it's not happening more. And you can tell by the number of people who are being dragged in, fined, and, and imprisoned for doing exactly those things. Okay. Just a few quick final thoughts, and I want to talk about realistic solutions. We've obviously talked long term about the state of the economy, about how the slowdown is managed, about switching priorities. Are there any uh, sort of short term fixes, things which could help alleviate the smog and the pollution, which China's has told us about already? I mean, I remember the, the cloud seeding that went on during the Olympics and things like that. Do any of those things exist? Um, Steve, I want to ask you. Well, the kind of things they did for the um Olympics or when there is a major international summit meeting in Beijing provide very temporary solutions. Um, they essentially try to clear the air for the few days when it was necessary to project a positive image for China. Mm. So I don't see those as real solutions. I think the real solutions will really be trying much harder to improve on the energy efficiency and on the enforcement of the environmental protection legislations in place mm -hmm. in China. I can accept that the shift from use of fossil fuel will be a longer term project that it will have to be done uh, step by step. Yeah. But the degree of inefficiency in the energy sector I think is very, very serious. Mm. Enforcement of the environmental protection regulations against are very, very patchy. I, I, I agree with the speaker from Beijing that they actually are doing more now, but a lot more can be done and should be done. Mm. I mean, today we are talking mostly in terms of the air pollution, but the problem of the environmental degradation is really across the board. Yep. A very large percentage of China's rivers are now completely polluted to the extent that it can, they cannot really be used uh, for most purposes. Okay, then. And a lot, a huge amount of Chinese land are poisoned. They need to be reduced. Steve saying thank you for that. I suspected there wouldn't be any short-term solution, but just wondered if there might be. <laughs> thank you so much for your time, Ina Tang and Steve Tsang and Tamana Savalieva joining us on Inside Story. And thank you for watching. As always, you can leave your comments on our program page.
aljazeera.com. You can post your views on facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story, or you can tweet us at AJ Inside Story as well. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team here at Inside Story. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.